Hey everyone, it's Snowman. Before we start today's episode, I just want to thank everyone who supported the Good Game Design series. It's been incredible for me to make, and I'm honored to receive all the positive feedback. Now, normally when I do the intro for these episodes, I'll ask some broad questions about gaming. I'll mention something about story, but then I'll move right on to my next thought. Well, not today. Now it's the story's time to shine. In today's episode of Good Game Design, we'll look at the silent storytelling principle. Most games have a story of some sort, but there are different ways for a game to tell it. Some do this through cutscenes or dialogue boxes, while others take a more organic approach, through gameplay. The silent storytelling principle is where you unravel the story of a game through your actions, rather than someone explaining it to you. A good example that comes to mind is Shadow of the Colossus. The short introduction in this game shows you bringing your dead girlfriend to this ancient temple to try and bring her back to life. Then some omniscient voice that calls itself Dorman tells you it might be possible if you go kill a bunch of colossus. That's it. You don't get a lot of story in the beginning. Instead, the true beauty of Shadow of the Colossus story is revealed in the small details. When you kill your first Colossus, these creepy black tendrils shoot into Wander's body. Uh, that doesn't seem normal. Then when you go back to the temple, the voice just tells you to go slay more Colossi. And eventually, you might start speculating why he wants you to kill them in the first place. They don't seem to be bothering anyone, and they don't even pay attention to you until you start shooting them with arrows or attacking them. Hey, stop it! You start to wonder if maybe you're the bad guy after all, and you're just doing the bidding of of some villainous entity. This is amplified by the fact that Wander slowly transforms over the course of the game, turning more pale and evil looking as tendrils continuously enter his body. This isn't told to you explicitly, you just slowly start to form these thoughts as you destroy Colossus after Colossus. The ending confirms your suspicions. As it turns out, you were never able to bring your girlfriend back to life, but instead you've made it possible for Dorman to be resurrected, using your body as its vessel. It's surprisingly in-depth for what little story is actually told through cutscenes. Most of the story is felt, as the player uncertainty keeps sneaking up on them while Wander slays innocent beasts. A more recent game that has blown me away with its silent storytelling is the indie exploration game Gone Home. It's an extremely story-driven game, so I want to be sure to warn you about spoilers before we proceed. Most of what you learn about the story in Gone Home isn't stated, it's discovered. You play as Caitlin Greenbrier, returning home from college to your family's house in Arbor Hill, Oregon in 1995. You find this out by seeing your name on your bags, and by the answering machine message that plays at the opening of the game. The first thing you see is a note from your sister Sam on the front door that says not to go looking for answers as to why she was gone. The front door is locked, but you can find the key if you search around the front porch area and find it hidden in a duck figurine. This teaches you that you might need to explore each room thoroughly in order to progress and find out what happened to your sister. Little do you know that you'll soon discover information on the other members of your family as well by analysis and deduction. One of the first things you'll see as you enter the house is the family portrait on the wall in the main lobby. You're a family of four, mom, dad, Sam, and yourself. As the player, you know nothing about these characters, but you learn their entire story just by finding things in your house. Let's start with the mother, Jan. In the front closet, you'll find a name badge that belongs to her from the Forestry Service, saying she's a senior conservationist. You'll also find a note near the beginning from a friend of your mom's wanting to hear about the new house they moved into. You realize they didn't always live here, this was a recent move. In the next room over, you find out by a newspaper clipping that the house actually belonged to your great uncle who passed away, but your family inherited it and moved in while Caitlin was away at college. You can see by the postcard she sends home that she thinks it's weird writing a new address for her family. Eventually, you find a memo about a promotion for your mother, as as well as an invitation to a concert from her new male co-worker. Another letter by the same friend from earlier urges Jan to spill the juicy details about her new boyfriend. While it turns out it was fairly innocent, there are clues that an affair may have crossed her mind at some point. But before you jump to conclusions about the mom, let's talk about Terry, the father. By entering the library, you can see Terry's workstation. He's a writer. There's a corkboard full of ideas and ramblings about JFK and conspiracy theories. At first I thought he was just nutty, but it turns out he wrote a successful book about the subject, and is working on the sequel. Some of the notes in the middle imply he wasn't happy with the results of his work, saying he could do better. Other letters in the library explain that the company he was writing for wanted to drop him because of his shoddy workmanship he submitted recently. So to pay the bills, he does small reviews of electronics for a magazine, evident by the letters and receipts for the TV in the living room. It would seem he's spinning his wheels not sure how to get his career off the ground. And near the end of the game, you discover a letter in the basement from his father reflecting on his book, saying he could do better, the same quote that's on the corkboard. This sort of ties the pieces together. He overworked himself in an attempt to please his father, but this led to writer's block, which in turn led to an unhappy marriage as he was consumed with his work. Again, this is all deduced by items you pick up around the house. It was never told to you plainly. 
Finally, let's talk about the sister, Sam. I haven't mentioned yet that this game actually does have narration. When you find special items in the house and pick them up, it will trigger various diary entries from Sam written to you, Caitlin. This is regular storytelling, but you find out a lot more about Sam just by examining things around the house. For example, Sam's narration explains that she wasn't fitting in at school, but you actually feel her pain when you read the crinkled up note in the garbage about a kid making fun of her, calling her the psycho house girl. Apparently, there were some rumors about the house being haunted because of your uncle's death. He wasn't seen much outside of his home near the end. Her diary tells you that she finally found a girl who became her friend named Lonnie, but this evidence is clear from the notes and mixtapes lying around the house. It soon revealed that Lonnie and Sam develop feelings for each other and start a relationship, which is hard for Sam to deal with because of these new feelings, but also because of her religious family. At least you can assume they're Christian by finding several Bibles on the bookshelves in the main lobby. Now what I didn't expect was the supernatural undertones present in Gone Home. The overall game feel is already spooky, with the lightning storm outside and the eerie silence and darkness this massive house provides. The creepy theme is first alluded to by a book found in the living room under a pillow fort. You could assume this was Sam and Lonnie's doing, having a sleepover and reading about ghosts and hauntings. Sam tells you through her diary about how they dug into their uncle's past and think he's haunting the house, but I really understood that when I found the note they made hidden in the wall panel. They used a Ouija board to talk to Oscar and he said he wanted to come back, but they stopped when they got too scared. It gave me chills. I was scared too after that, especially when I saw the attic with glowing red lights locked in the upper hallway. Perhaps the most disturbing discovery was when you find a sacrificial ceremony in the closet to bring Oscar back to life, and the key to the attic. I didn't want to go up there, who knows what I would find. But if you do have the guts to enter the attic, you'll find the last entry in the diary. It explains that Lonnie was going into the army but couldn't go through with it and wanted Sam to meet her in Salem so they could run away together. That's why your sister was gone. It's a beautiful, elaborate story that melds narration and silent storytelling perfectly into a rich tale that just left me sitting there taking it all in afterward as the credits rolled. You don't interact with any people at all, but you feel the pain of each character as you discover what they were going through. In most good game design episodes, I have the principle I want to talk about first, and then try to find examples in a video game, but when I played Gone Home, it inspired this whole episode. That being said, I'm sure there are a lot of games out there that do a good job of telling you details about a story silently. If you can think of some, tell me in the comments below, I'd love to check them out. That about wraps up this episode of Good Game Design. Thanks for watching. I'm Snowman, and if you enjoyed, you could like and comment your thoughts, or subscribe for more videos just like this one. The last episode of Good Game Design about growing stronger in The Legend of Zelda is right here. And if you missed the Snow Globes, my video game awards for 2014, click here to check them out. You can find me on Twitter, Facebook, and Twitch under Snowman Gaming, all one word. Thanks again, and I hope to see you around.